Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. And welcome to Governor State University. We're so happy that you have come out this afternoon to join us to discuss Charlottesville. We are hoping that you will learn more than you knew before you came. Again, I'm Dr. Mary D. Bruce. I'm in public administration in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I would like to, for all of us to acknowledge and have a moment of silence in honor of the woman who lost her life at this horrendous incident in Charlottesville. Let us have a moment of silence for Heather D. Heyer. Thank you. And now I would like to bring to you the president, President Elaine P. Maiman of Governor State University. She will bring greetings. Uh, thank you, Mary, and welcome everyone to Governor State University. It's so important that we come together. It's so important that we reflect and discuss what is happening in our world. And I want to give special thanks to the people who organized this opportunity for us. And you have Mary Bruce, Vince Jones, a uh, well, special welcome to Gia Orr, who uh, is our uh, keynote speaker. I'm really eager to hear what you have to say. Uh, and also to the groups that organized this event. Uh, the Master of Public Administration Program, Pi Alpha Alpha Global Honor Society, and the Governor State University Campus Inclusion Team. Uh, and it's very much the under the auspices of that group that uh, you are all coming together to uh, talk about inclusivity. I find myself very often quoting a, a phrase from H.G. Wells. He said this a, a while ago now. It was just at the uh, dawn of World War II. And what he said was that more and more civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. And I think that here at Governor State University, we are winning that race by coming together and reflecting, analyzing, looking at some of the horrendous events that flash by on our television screen and on social media and pervade our lives. But I'm so pleased to see classes here from various parts of the curriculum, deans, faculty, students, community members, because it's only through reflecting on what is happening that we will be able to transcend and prevail and make sure that core values of this nation, of this democracy, of civility, of, of the ability to find common ground, the ability to respect difference, the ability to learn from each other. Governor State University is in that sense, uh, yes, as every university should be, a place where we can come together for these difficult conversations. But I think we can also see it as a, what I like to call a free zone. That is a place where every group, uh, every, people of every background are welcomed, included, whose voices can be heard. And that's what this uh, meeting together is all about. So I just want to say thank you, all of you. Thank you for making a commitment to reflection, to analysis, to thinking rather than to violence and uh, closing of the mind, uh, but instead to come together so that we can make sure that education prevails. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Mayman. 
And now I would like to bring to you my dean, the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, who is just a very special person because I emailed him and I said, Andre, are we going to have a talk about Charlottesville when it happened? And he immediately, he did not ignore my email. He said, Mary, I agree with you. I think we should do it. And he allowed this forum to, to happen. And he supported us with making it happen. I just want to thank you for that publicly. So um, it's people like Dr. Bruce that make my job easy, right? Um, these are needed and necessary conversations. Um, I want to thank uh, Mary, but not only Mary, I want to thank uh, Vince Jones and uh, Juan Gutierrez uh, for pushing for this. They reached out immediately after Charlottesville and asked that we have a discussion. We've done, sadly, we've done these before, right? Um, there's been a series of, of nasty responses to progress on civil and racial rights in the United States. Um, sadly, this is part of our long history, these trajectories, and so we need to really have these conversations, but we also, there's a lot of work at the other end of this, too, is to push for progress again. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Rupert Evans and Maristella Zell, who are the leaders of our campus inclusion team. I'm on that, but there's a wide number of, a good group of people across the university, including students who take part in these discussions. Um, we're doing more, so there'll be an all-day symposium on the 10th here to talk about a range of different issues that, that we face, um, a lot of them about pushback against progress. So let me, as a historian, and I don't want to take anything away from David here, uh, we work in different areas, right, but we're both historians of the modern period, and we both study race, and we both study inequity. Um, you know, I, I think it's worth, a lot of people think that history and the history of the United States is one about improvement. And uh, um, improvement's never inevitable, and people pay lots of prices for getting improvement. Um, and so any time that there's an advance, there's always blowback, right? So you can think about immigration in the 19-teens, and then the response with a, a set of laws that bar people from Eastern and Southern European, and we don't talk about it enough, all people of color get barred from immigration into the United States in 1924. Then we get civil rights movement, and then we get Nixon's uh, silent white majority backlash, of which my parents were part of that, right? So my parents left Milwaukee, moved to an all-white suburb. Um, they were part of the problem, not part of the solution. So while history is not always about improvement, it also doesn't repeat itself, right? There's no automatic next progressive wave that's more inclusive unless we fight for those things. So we have a lot to learn about history, which means that we need to be attentive to these things. And as President Maimon would tell you, it means that the liberal arts matter a lot, right? So we need to work on these things, but we need to know ourselves. And then I guess as a last thing before I introduce uh, uh, Dr. Evans, is that tolerance isn't enough, right? So we, we're not, liberal education isn't just about us tolerating each other, it's embracing each other, our differences, the different things we bring to the table, how we can learn from each other, and uh, those sorts of things. So um, getting the acceptable bar of, of mere tolerance is never enough. So um, thank you for inviting me to speak briefly, um, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Evans. Good afternoon. This is going to be a, a, a good afternoon. I, it's going to be an afternoon where you get to, to really think deeply about what's happening in our society, what's happening in, 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 what's happening in our environment. Uh, we've been going through challenge after challenge. Uh, we've had all kinds of things that we would have now in 2017 think would, should not be happening. And yet, every time we turn on the TV, uh, we see that there's another um, major negative event that happens to our society. Uh, most recently now in New York, where we, we've lost lives again to hate and intolerance. And that's what we're gonna be talking a little bit about this evening. Uh, we're gonna talk about it in, and we're gonna frame it in a conversation around Charlottesville. I uh, have the honor of, uh, of serving as the, just the facilitator for today. And so those of you who came in, you will have known that you got a uh, white uh, index card. If you do not want to come to the mic during the question and answer period, 
and say what's on your mind, please write it down and hand it to me, and uh, I'll make sure that your question uh, gets uh, um, answered by our panelists. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our, our keynote speaker for the day, uh, a young woman who, who traveled all the way out here to, to share with us this afternoon, and, and uh, we really appreciate you, uh, Gia, so thank you for that. She is, um, she is a scholar, you know, she has a double master's degree. But you know, the most important thing that she does is that she is the person who's responsible for employees and citizens of Illinois as they focus on safeguarding rights of people with disabilities and traditionally uh, those in non-traditional settings. She has 15 years of tenure in education, seven years as an assistant principal or principal and uh, she was appointed by the Legislative Com Committee member in ASCD, Washington, D.C. Um, she is now, she was confirmed as a commissioner with Cook County's Human Rights Commission, and she serves on a series of boards and other organizations. So with, with her vast uh, bio, we won't go through every line of it, but we wanna welcome her for uh, coming out to speak to us this afternoon, so thank you. Ms. Gia Orr. Afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. First of all, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I um, was a little taken aback at being able to come out and do something like this at, at this stage of my career, which I still think I'm on the lower rung of the ladder, and I have many more rungs to climb. Um, and so, you know, being able to come out and speak with you all on something this important. Um, and I recognize that it is, in so many instances, difficult conversations for people to have. So as such, being a keynote speaker, and I said to Dr. Bruce, I was like, keynote, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> I wanted to share with you the types of conversations I have with myself as I watch these news stories scroll about. I'm a native New Yorker, so of course, the events um, that just transpired are near and dear and close. I went to um, undergrad down south at Tennessee State University in Nashville, so when things occur down south, just from my tenure there, that's near and dear and close because I consider uh, my southern roots part of my family. And then, of course, there are the things that transpire in our everyday lives here. And that's what I really want to focus on, um, and I hope I do it justice by just engaging with you. I'm not here to inform. I'm not here to instigate. I'm not here to incite. I'm simply here to engage with you. Um, the facts of Charlottesville. So I had a, a, a good run at this because when they said, well, lay out the facts of Charlottesville. It's a little hard to be behind. I'm, I'm a teacher by trade, so I kind of <laughs> want to walk through everybody and touch your shoulders at the same time. Um, but the facts of Charlottesville, well, I had a hard time grappling with that because when you say, what are the facts of Charlottesville, minus the propaganda and everything else that gets infused in there, then here's what I came out with as the facts. You may not agree, but this is what I define as the facts of Charlottesville that I can quantify and I see it as for sure. As a teacher, when we teach meaningful sentences, we always did who, what, when, where, why, and how. <laughs> right? It gives you the basis of what you need to formulate a proper and full opinion, correct? correct. As such, who? Really, the who starts with Jason Kessler. Jason Kessler decided that based on his beliefs and feelings of what was going on in his immediate vicinity, which was the taking down of Confederate statues, uh, but also, in his words, the delegitimization of whites as seen by supremacy groups. The what? He simply organized a rally. It was called Unite the Right. I found the flyer and everything. That's a fact. When? It was August 12th. Where? Charlottesville, Virginia, on the University of Virginia's campus. Why? Again, he said he was spurred by what was going on around him. 
He did file for a permit. Um, of course, counter protesters came up against that and the governor decided to halt um, what was supposed to be the most organized portion of the rally at that, part, at that point. Everything that happened from that point on, everything that happened from that point on, I was not there. I do not know for sure. I don't know who started it. I don't know how it spilled into all the different places that it did. I simply wanted to lay out for you what were the actual facts that I could find. Because when you Google it, you're going to get every slant <laughs> that you can possibly find because this is what has become our infused method of getting information. So I just wanted to point out that if we look at the facts, we do know that there were charges that were levied after uh, this event, why they were levied, um, what has since happened. I'm unable to get thorough information on, and I have called the state of Virginia with no reply, of course. <laughs> as such, we know this is playing out in other states as well, as recently as Tennessee, as uh, Florida, where rallies have been planned, but they haven't gone as uh, fruitfully as people thought they would. But what I do know for sure is that as when we get into groups, whatever group we identify with, somehow we dig in. We dig into our beliefs and what continues to perpetuate some of the problems that we have with one another is the propaganda that divides us. So again, I'm telling you the conversations I have with myself. I am an insomniac. You may not know that, but there are people in this room who know. I'm up two, three, four in the morning, emailing folks, texting. Hey, when you wake up, you'll see I'm already thinking. <laughs> um, and they have the news for insomniacs. They call it uh, World News Now, <laughs> right? right? So I'm, I'm always there, but I'm always looking for the changes in how when I first hear it at 2.30 a.m., which is typically when I wake up, um, and how the writers of the news somehow change it. Yes. Somewhere between 4 a.m. and 4.30 when it gets local, and then you get to Good Morning America, you see I'm an ABC7 girl. <laughs> but I watch the writing of the very same news change from here's what it is now to here's what it spins into mm -hmm. as the day wears on. And I will be remiss if I didn't say there are similarities of behaviors on both sides of the governing bodies. So what's our country's preoccupation with differences and, and what divides us? I'm not going to answer that question. I'm just putting it on you. Um, that you would think about what is our preoccupation with division? Why is it that in our everyday lives we look for what's different between me and the next person? Whether it's the degrees we have, the materialistic things that we have, um, you name it, we look for division in everything. And what has led us to this place where we challenge one another socially and civilly, civilly, but without regard for humanity. Where have we lost our sense of humanity? I have to ask you another question that I ask myself. Is violence during advocacy for beliefs the price of freedom? Let me ask you that again. Really think about that. Is violence during advocacy for beliefs the price we pay for freedom. But I'll go a little further. Well, then what is freedom? And are we truly free? I'm not answering these questions. I'm just putting it out here to you. Is silence approval? Okay, some people say silence equals consent. But if one group feels delegitimized but remains silent, 
are they consenting to being marginalized? I'll ask that again. If a group, or even me as a singular person, feels delegitimized, but I remain silent because I so choose at that moment. Maybe I need to think over it a little bit. Maybe I need a few more facts. Are they consenting to being marginalized? Our country's greatest successes and failures are rooted in historical events that have scars. It's the reality of this country. There are some people who have benefited from those very scars that are the very history that we teach from about third grade when it gets deep in history. <laughs> Start talking about democracy and you know the spiel, right? Revolutionary War, et cetera. So we get deep around third grade. Are we at a place where our scars that we bear as a country are those that we are unable to accept? Because again, some have benefited from the very scars that are the history of this country, while others have been pressed down even further. So then we talk about the give and take. And we are still at this place now. We have conflicts amongst majority and minority. But somehow, this definition of majority and the definition of minority shifts. We put everything still on race. It's our big one that we're so fascinated with. But if you really think about it at this very moment, and you think about groups, what majorities can you say that you belong to? There are other majorities that we all belong to in some way, shape, or form. The educated. Mm -hmm. we'll leave that to statistics, some would say. We might be the minority. I don't believe such. But just think about what other groups you belong to that would be considered the majority, and then the people who consider themselves the minority, the opposite of that group that you're in, do they feel marginalized or downtrodden by the fact that they're not a part of that majority group that you're in? Again, I'm not here to answer the question. I'm just here to ask it. Is it easier living life tearing down walls, striving for harmony? Or is it easier building them and furthering our divides? Think about that. It's a hard road. It's a hard road. We have eons of people before us who have walked this journey before. Tear down the walls, live in harmony. They, most of them, sacrifice their lives. Then there are some who believe it's so much easier to just build a wall. <laughs> so much easier. But again, what is it that you feel? It's okay to be staunch in our beliefs. I do not think that anybody in this room, any couple of bodies in this room could sit down and list 50 things and you will have all those 50 things to say. We all have a belief in some different arena. We all go off into different paths, be it the way that you were raised, the culture that you come from, the cultures that you've assimilated with, totally different than the culture that you come from. I'm a native New Yorker. We're a melting pot. At least that's what we say. But when you break down the boroughs, it's no different than what I see here in Chicago. This town, that town, your side of town. Your beliefs, though, as we all know, and I'm, I'm not preaching, or teaching, I'm just engaging, your belief should be rooted in truth. As such, the propaganda, the opinions of others, and our big, big, big group think issue that we have. Thank you, social media. <laughs> 
spreading falsehoods is not advocating for whose founding platform. The founding platform here in this country was you should be free to be blank. You. That's what I feel it with all the time. You are free to be you as long as your you does not restrict my me and what my me is trying to accomplish for my me and my mini me and be you. Be it freely and then don't question who I choose to be at the same time. You don't have to know what you're doing to create change. That's what I want to close with. I think a lot of people are like, what should I do? Where do I go? Do I join a group? You don't have to know what you're doing. You are the change at the very moment that you make a choice, a free will choice at that, to do better, be better, know more, because the more we know, the better we do. At least that's what I subscribe to. Time, both past and present, have proven that we can't legislate our way to humanity. I'm going to say that again. We can't legislate our way to humanity. Because now I work in government, so I hear a lot of people say, you all should be, what you all should be doing. Why hasn't a bill been written? Not my job. We can't legislate our way into humanity. We can't give more guidelines. The federal government provides us with these guidelines that give us letters. But we can't guideline our way to making decisions about being more civil toward one another, more humane. But again, I know it's a daily. It's a daily. With every single one of us, it's daily. When someone cuts you off in traffic, me, and calls you out your name and attaches a, a race to that name, then I make a free will choice to do better and be better at that moment than to let everything that's going on around me that I saw in the news from 2.30 in the morning <laughs> until 7 whenever we rush out the house, I make that free will choice not to let all of that envelop me and then change the way in which I interact with said person in the middle of LaSalle Street on a random Thursday morning. That's what this is about. That's what civility is. It's not, you don't have to put a long, big definition to it to just do it. Simplify it. How do you interact differently daily? And with that being said, again, I'm not here to inform, incite, enrage. Simply to engage, and I look forward to the furthering conversation. Panelists, again, thank you for having me. I hope that in some way, shape, or form, I have at least uh, turned a light on or uh, enabled someone to feel very, very comfortable in this safe space here at Governor State to have the conversations that need to be had. I bid you all a blessed evening. Have a good day. Gia, uh, would you sit up there and even though <laughs> okay, um, I, I'd like to, uh, before I introduce this uh, illustrious panel of uh, individuals who are going to share with you this afternoon, I'd like to do a couple of more introductions. Uh, uh, the w a couple of the programs that actually partnered with us to put this on was the Public Administration Program, and the coordinator for that program is in the audience with us today, too, and that's uh, Dr. Susan Gaffney. Susan? today and I would like to thank everyone for coming. As the program for 
coordinator for criminal justice, political justice, and public administration, I am proud to have colleagues that continue to foster and encourage students to become politically and civically engaged. I'm hoping that events of this nature will inspire all of you to continue to work in your communities and to become more involved and become community agents of change. Thank you. And if anybody knows Dr. Gaffney, they, they know that she's never short for words, but that's the shortest I've ever heard her speak. <laughs> and then there's a very, very important uh, uh, person here today that, that we should acknowledge, and, and that's our state representative, Will Davis. And uh, I want to thank him for coming out and, and spending this afternoon with us, uh, Representative Davis. Would you like to say something? Okay, thank you. Uh, the moderator of, the, of today's panel is uh, Dr. Vincent R. Jones. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my, my voice in the background told me also the other organization that is, uh, that, that is sponsoring this for you today is Pi Alpha Alpha Honor Society. And uh, Mary Bruce is just going to say a few words about that. Yes. Byron Stanley is in class. He's the vice president. And Erica Stuckey is the president of the Honor Society. Pi Alpha Alpha Honor Society is a part of the Master of Public Administration program. They have sponsored the refreshments for today. And I just want to acknowledge Pi Alpha Alpha Global Honor Society, where I serve as the advisor of great students. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and I'm, I'm sorry I uh, omitted that. But uh, now I'd like to introduce the panel. Our moderator for tonight is Dr. Vincent R. Jones, uh, JD, and uh, he teaches in the College of Arts and Sciences, and he's gonna actually lead the discussion this evening. Uh, we also have on our panel Renee Bethe from Eastern Illinois University, and uh, uh, Renee is actually a student. We also have Dr. Donald Culverson, uh, Associate Professor of the College of Arts and Sciences. We have uh, uh, Craig, Dr. Craig Eckert, PhD, and he's a Professor Emeritus and Chair of the Sociology uh, Department of Eastern Illinois University. One of my teachers. <laughs> We have our president of the Faculty Senate, Dr. David Gollin, PhD, and he is Associate Professor of Arts and Sciences. And we have a student with us, Juan Gutierrez, and uh, he, Juan, you're in the, the Public Administration Program? I'm actually in, um, I just switched over to Communications. Okay, so he's now in uh, a, a communications major, arts and sciences as well. <laughs> and then we have uh, Doc, uh, well, uh, Deidre Woods Stokes. She is also an attorney, JD, and she's an adjunct professor in the College of Business and, uh, and Management here at Governor State University. And she's also a practicing attorney uh, with a major law firm here in, uh, in the Southlands. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Vince, who's going to lead the dialogue for this evening. All right. Thank you, Rupert. <laughs> okay, first, thank you, Rupert. Can you hear me? All right, so I like to move around, and I'm, I'm mic'd up, so I want to <laughs> thank you all for coming and get right to having our distinguished panelists answer some questions for us. For our students in the audience, anyone in the audience, you should have a white card. If you have a question and you want to just have someone read the question for you, Dr. Evans here will, will accept your question, read it for you, or feel free to come to the mic. There's a mic here and a mic over, over at the other end of the room, and we can uh, take, take your question as you ask it directly. I'd like to begin, if I could, with Dr. Eckert. Dr. Eckert, can you explain or give us your opinion what do you attribute to the rise in hate groups in America today? Well, uh, can I make a little preface remark before I answer the Absolutely. question? Absolutely. Uh, I'm really a very pessimistic person, so I'm, I'm very amazed at this kind of a turnout, and I really want to 
<laughs> congratulate you people at Governor's State for this kind of a turnout. Fantastic. So I applaud you for coming out. Uh, uh, the best thing I could do, Vince, is, uh, you know, you're a media generation. I would tell you to go to the uh, 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 SPLC uh, website, the Southern Poverty uh, Law Center. It's in Montgomery, Alabama. I had the great privilege of leading students on an alternative spring break to work down in the Montgomery area, and we went and visited the museum there. Uh, the beauty of that website is it would give you the kind of information that I don't want to take up the other panelists' time, but it studies things like what kinds of, where are hate groups located, where are they, documents what states they're from, but, you know, a quick tour would be the, the kinds of things that you hear about uh, uh, terrorists. You know, you're going to hear about disaffected individuals. You're going to talk about people who feel like they've been closed out from opportunities, especially economic ones. You're going to feel, you're going to hear things about uh, a, re a resentment feeling that they've been left out of the American dream. Uh, the thing I would caution, even though sociologists, what we do for a living is generalize, uh, you have to be careful because uh, People in hate groups are from every kind of walk of life. I just read a really interesting piece in The New Yorker a few weeks ago about a person who was outed as a white supremacist and he was, grew up in a really, really rich neighborhood not too far from where I grew up in New Jersey. Very educated parents, uh, typically liberal, liberal uh, from a diverse uh, area and stuff like that. And, uh, when I looked at some of the stuff that he had been putting out on the internet, it was some of the most virulent racism that you could imagine. So you have to be careful about making generalizations. Uh, but uh, so again, I would direct you to the Southern Poverty Law Center website and you can read, read up on a whole spew of things. My, my last thing, so I, I really am not overdoing, uh, something your, uh, your dean said, you know, uh, read. Don't just connect to the internet. Read and read stuff that you don't even agree with, and that's really important if you want to be informed about these kind of issues. All right. So that's the best I can do with the limited time. Don't want to take up a lot of other people's time. Great, great. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Gollin. I want to wonder if you could piggyback off what the Dr. Arison said, and just for the sake of giving us perspective, do you believe America has ever gotten over the division of the Civil War? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Care to elaborate? <laughs> Where to begin? I mean, uh, but <laughs> this is a racist nation, and the division of the Civil War um, was between people who wanted to maintain white supremacy with slavery and people who by and large wanted to maintain white supremacy without slavery. Um, and we've continued to fight these battles uh, since then. And, um, uh, but I, I will argue that there has been some progress. Uh, for instance, 80, 90 years ago, um, most so-called white people had no problem being in a newspaper photograph at a lynching. At least today, they're hiding, <laughs> right? There is a sense that it is not civil uh, to engage in, in racism at that level. And, um, and we have had uh, some great strides. I would argue, by the way, that you can, to an extent, you can legislate humanity. Um, I think, for instance, uh, uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act would be an example of legislating positively towards humanity. You still need to implement it, of course, by... Absolutely discussing it with one another and, and talking about... have accountability. About, right. <laughs> Very important, the accountability part. Yes. Um, are we still fighting it? Uh, uh, absolutely. I, I, uh, there, the, there are statues up... I mean, you know, we often talk about how history is written by the winners, and yet we have statues, not just in the South, that are celebrating the losers of this war. Um, and it is, frankly, it is the equivalent of if I, as... As a secular Jew, if I were to go to Germany and see a statue of Goebbels or Hitler um, on my way to work, if I were to have, if I were to live and work there, um, I, I can't imagine being happy with with that. Right. Um, so yes, we're still very much fighting it. Thank you, thank you. That's an interesting perspective, Dr. Culverson. It seems like the, our politicians are taking advantage of these 
divisions that we have, what do you say is the attraction for dividing us by politicians? I guess I think that um, for the most part, politicians like to take advantage of our short-term memory, or shall I say our <laughs> ADHD. I mean, as a society, we uh, have a very selective memory of, or amnesia about the past. I mean, you know, 15 minutes ago. Uh, and so I, as a result, I think, you know, if you think about how technology has evolved in ways that allows those short-term memories to be exploited, uh, for one of my classes, I was reading a, a book by the uh, Chicana feminist uh, Elizabeth Martinez, and she talked about the power of the uh, origin myth in American society, the myths about how the nation was started. And she, talks, she's, uh, she identifies three particular problems with that. One is that the origin myths ignore that most of the land acquired for this nation came from the people who were already here, Native Americans. And to move one step back from there, how, do you dis how does Christopher Columbus, think about the power of the Christopher Columbus discovery narrative. One little problem with that, how do you discover a continent or two continents where there are 80 million people? And so part of this, uh, this sort of, <laughs> this origin myth, I mean, they go very deep. Okay, so we can't ignore the fact that genocide against Native Americans, that continues to some extent these days. Certainly we cannot ignore slavery, and then we can not ig ignore the imperialism that led to capture and control of millions of people in the southwestern part of the United States as well as those in the Caribbean and the Pacific. And so it's a very, to use the words of the late uh, folk blues musician Gil Scott Heron, this is a violent civilization if civilization is what it is. And just to, 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 to end here, I think that part of the difficulty is that we have a rhetoric of progress that, is, that ignores the violence that has underwritten much of what the nation has done. You know, as as, as, as uh, my colleague D David Gollin would say, we indeed have a rhetoric of common ground. We think about the labor movement in that regard, but we don't often turn to that. We ignore that as well. And so the, the, there's a lot of progress that we've made, but somehow we, tur we turn away from progress and we, we go back to the violent rhetoric. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent answer. Renee, students have always seem to be at the forefront of change, typically positive change. Where do you see the role of students today in trying to bring about a more cohesive America? Well, I, I was a young student once, and now I'm an older student, as they call an adult student. And um, I think one of the things that young people having been a young person and still understanding that, um, something that they lack in their lives at the university is really um, getting down into the, what they're learning and under really, truly getting a grasp at what they are learning, not just taking a class and after 12 weeks flushing the toilet and the information is gone. So being an adult learner and having this theme thrown on my plate and being invited here, I thought it, the first thing I have to do is do my homework. So I started with a film on the civil rights movement so that I could refresh because a third grader does not remember what the civil <laughs> rights movement was about. <laughs> Point one. Uh, Another thing, this is all my homework, so you can see I've spent, even though I do have a lot of homework to do, and I teach preschoolers, so I'm constantly active. Um, I got an American Anti-Slavery and Civil Rights timeline just to see when it all started so far back and why it's still not progressed to where it should be. Um, since... Mr. Vince is a, a lawyer, and many others here. I looked into the First Amendment to understand that and how we are to properly place ourselves on the street. 
in assembly what it is to be a proper assembly. Then I was thinking Charlottesville. Well, darn, I have to know something about Charlottesville. So uh, I went to the history and gardens of Emancipation Park and I learned a lot about Charlottesville and where the Lee Park was came from, which was extremely interesting. Um, it was actually a very nice man who purchased all the parks and developed them into parks. They were just city blocks. So um, this was very interesting education on Charlottesville. Then um, I went wanted to know why people were so interested in taking Mr. Lee's statue down. So I went and studied up on General Lee, who he was, where he studied, um, what was his position in the military. Was he just a soldier for the one side? Was he truly like a terrible man and, and everything? Or what was his background? Where did he come from? Should we just judge a person by knowing what's going on in this march? So is there something behind what's going on in that thing? Um, then because I don't trust, okay, this sounds really bad, don't get on me, but I don't trust our media, our newscast, because like I think it has a tendency to sensationalize and give impressions that are have been mulled over, like our keynote speaker said very eloquently. Um, these things digress the more people talk about them. So I went and read up from Al Jazeera several things things on, from Al Jazeera, different part of the world, different impressions. Um, America is being viewed not just by Americans, but by the world. BBC, very good newscasting. Um, since I am German heritage, I went, uh, did some research in Germany, so this was that. Uh, then back home, um, Essence Magazine, okay? Uh, Black Lives Matter article. Washington Post, another Black Lives Matter. It's key to what's going on because this is, in fact, a very thick article on uh, the roots of the Black Lives Matter, uh, where they came from, what kind of people are they, Who, who's been um, behind, they say, the new birth of a new civil rights movement. Who are these people? How did it start? Very interesting. In the back of my head, I always keep this. It's from, I uh, do read the Bible. I'm a Christian. And since we live in a free country, I'll say that. Um, this is my premise that I live by uh, from Galatians 5. It says, you brothers were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor, neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So kind of like our insomniac <laughs> speaker there, over there, I think about all these things. The stuff runs through my brain, and I think about um, some of the things I learned in sociology um, on social movements and the birth of the civil rights movement, which was propelled... Um, all of our modern movements. Um, Renee, if I could just interrupt you for just, a, for just a moment. Yeah. You've done a tremendous amount of research preparing for today. I just want my students to take note of that, by the way. That's beside the point. These are things that keep me up at night, believe it or not. Um, but I so found let me, let me you ask you a follow-up question. You two texting each other. Right. <laughs> not at 2.30, because I'm right. not an insomniac yet. <laughs> <laughs> Renee, if I could, I'd like Juan to step in and, and okay. ask, ask part of that question as well. Juan, you're more of the traditional student. Mm -hmm. How do you think that students that are traditional today are affected by what's going on in, in the country? What's, what's your perspective? Well, first off, I want to say when this actually first happened, I actually felt a little bit ignorant because we all think this stuff shouldn't be happening in today's era. Um, our generation likes to see the good in people. So to actually start seeing this stuff happening, it just took me out of my mind. I was like, I don't know what's going on. So I feel like as students, um, we need to actually start speaking out more. Like we do it with our friends and we do it 
in our classrooms, but to actually take a stand against what's going on, to actually do a public um, protest as they are doing will really help us out. Okay, now Renee mentioned the First Amendment. Deidre, you know I'm coming toward you now. Lawyers are always talking about First Amendment rights, right to freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. And even in Charlottesville, there was a legal permit to protest. My question to you, should the First Amendment protect this type of hate speech, this type of assembly? So first and foremost, I think that um, one of the things that uh, our keynote speaker indicated was that with the news, the raw news, when it first hits, that's the best time to get news. And you may not be up at 2.30, but maybe in the morning. And I always tell my students or my peers to read in between the lines. You're educated. Not that the news is fake news. What it is is that the news is about sensationalism and what is going to grasp you at the time. So all the little details, you know, there's only so many words that I can write. And so, so therefore, in exercising my right to free speech and put it in the newspaper. So that's what I want to start off with. But going back to the question that was posed to me is that when we think about the First Amendment and when it actually came about was in the 1700s, it was, it was, it was actually created to provide some type of equality for minority, for minority viewpoints so that people would have the right to assemble without someone infringing upon their right of assembly. But it was never, the premise behind it was never so that you could oppress a group. It was so that a minority was able to, or minority viewpoint, not a minority, but a minority viewpoint or a minority group or people that maybe didn't have a lot of people that shared that same frame of thought, that they would be able to assemble, they would be able to assemble peacefully, they would be able to speak peacefully. It was never incorporated or created so that it would give the platform for violence or to incite or to ignite anything like that. So it's difficult in the law to create um, a law that says, but, because we would go on and on, but this, but that, and that. Even though I know a lot of people believe that in the law there's long run-on sentences, but honestly, we need to be able to decipher it. And you never want something that's so confining when you're giving people freedom to do something. So you want to create this, um, you want to create a, we have the First Amendment, we have the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, and back in the 1700s, <laughs> those of you that possibly have seen <laughs> Hamilton, because uh, I know we have millennials in here, the way that we dueled and we did whatever, what we, we shot, right? We had our, we went home, we got our, you know, we, we got our muskets, <laughs> we, we got our guns, and we took 10 paces and we turned around, and maybe we shot, maybe we didn't take the 10 paces or whatever, but it was that time, it related to that time. So we take that, and even the ACLU has back, I've read a couple of articles as well, where they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are protecting the First Amendment rights, but when we get together and we're inciting people and we're inciting violence, that is not the meaning of the First Amendment. So to answer your question, the purpose and the reason for these was to try to give a platform to, e to give everybody an equal opportunity to assemble, to speak, to write, so that you wouldn't feel that those rights were infringed upon, but it was never intended so that you could oppress a group, a people, a viewpoint, or anything like that. But it's difficult to put that in there. So therefore, when you see cases, that's the reason why we have case law, is because case law is utilized to try to flush out what was the reasoning and the theory behind the writers and the drafters of the First Amendment. And when you see the First Amendment, you have to take it back, or you see any of our constitutional, you have to take it back to that time and that period. Okay, so when it's very difficult for us to limit that, but it was never put in place if we do our research to support hate groups. But if a hate group wanted to come together 
they have the right to assemble, but the way that they assemble and the way that they come together. So there are, and that's what, it's broad, so therefore they allow local laws to put certain rules in place when you do assemble, because I can do that. As long as I am not in direct conflict with the law, I can actually create some rules in my village of University Park, how you assemble. It doesn't infringe upon you, but if you assemble, you can't maybe carry weapons, you can't carry sticks. I can say that, or we can say that, and we can vote upon that, and those can be the rules for this place. And so we have to think, and as we evolve, we have to be more creative so that we can deter, we can prevent certain actions that took place when we saw Charlottesville. Very good. Okay, okay, now I'm gonna come back to you because I'm still not sure that I'm satisfied with where we're gonna go from here. But before I do that, I wanna go back to Dr. Erickson and ask you, what is this attraction with symbols of the Confederacy? As it was pointed out earlier, th we are celebrating the losers of a, of a civil war. Why are people still hanging on to these edifices of, of, of losing? I defer to the historians at Penn. <laughs> some attachment to some sense of status, of mm -hmm. feeling you can somehow rewrite history or you weren't quite the losing side. I, I have to confess here, but I, I, it's hard for me to grasp what, <laughs> what that attraction really is. I, I mean, as a sociologist and as a, a person, it's just really difficult for me to, to to see it, I, if I just a little time. One thing I would advise: if you get a minute, look at the uh, YouTube of, of that uh, young female who does the interview with one of the main organizers of the Charlottesville uh, rally, and it's uh, it's really disturbing. And I think everybody should look. I, I, that would be the person to bring in, I guess, to ask about what's your attachment to the statue and the symbols, uh, it's just very disturbing. It's hard to believe, uh, you know, picking up on both of my two colleagues here to my right's point about, uh, you know, there's progress and then you listen to someone like that speak and you, you, you realize we have a long way to go, you know, in spite of the progress. Okay, all right. Didn't do a very good job, I'd give myself a C minus. I'd give you a higher grade than that. <laughs> Dr. Culverson, how can we move forward from here? We certainly have a large segment of society that still is attracted to the Confederacy, symbols of the South, and that seems to be something that we can't move away from. I, I heard on the news this morning that in South Carolina, they are thinking of changing the plaques. And instead of celebrating some of these Civil War Confederate quote unquote heroes, they're actually saying these were people that committed crimes against humanity. What do you think about that? Hmm. It's a difficult question, but I think two things come to mind. First of all, I think it's to acknowledge that where progress has been made in our society. Uh, and we can look at any number of things. I mean, going back 200 years, 250 years, we can look at the abolitionist movement. I mean, it was a movement of many different types of people. We can look at the women's rights movement. We can labor, labor various labor aspects of the labor movement. We can look more recently at civil rights activism of the 1950s and 60s, and it was not just a black movement. It was a movement of all Americans. Many different Americans of, uh, across the racial and ethnic spectrum participated in it. Uh, we can look at numerous examples <coughs> you know, people across racial and ethnic lines working together. I mean, and I would argue uh, vigorously that whatever benefits we enjoy today, the benefits of association, benefits of freedom, are because we have worked together. Many of us have worked together for generations across racial and ethnic lines. Uh, one example, I think that it's, again, not by design, but sometimes, you know, people get along because they have to. Um, there's a high school, I'm from Southern California, uh, suburban Los Angeles, but there's a high school in Long Beach, California, Long Beach Poly High School. Uh, two of its most famous attendants, not graduates, are the uh, entertainer, uh, the actress uh, Cameron Diaz, who did not graduate, and the 
other uh, uh, Snoop Dogg. Uh, and what other, what other opportunity do you have to bring in Snoop Dogg to such a <laughs> conversation? <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's right. <laughs> no matter what. Yeah. <laughs> but what I was going to say about the high school that, that they, uh, they went to, Long Beach Poly High School, uh, my grandparents, my late grandparents, many years ago lived in the neighborhood. The neighborhood has experienced a lot of uh, decline since then. But it's a magnet school. And so the populations of the students there, student body, something like 25, 25, 25. Uh, 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 Latino, Asian American, African American, and White American. And uh, it's a very poor neighborhood, but because it's a magnet school, because it's an excellent education program, uh, they have, they produce the highest numbers, percentage of California high schools, they produce the highest number of students who go into the University of California system and also to the Ivy Leagues. So how is it that this school in this really rough neighborhood, uh, wouldn't they have problems with crime? No. They don't because the, the ethnic racial groups are in relatively equal proportion. And so apparently people just work to get along. I mean, I think that's a lesson to our whole society. You know, uh, none of us ask to be in this position, but you know, people find out ways to work together. And I think that that's the tradition our politicians do not draw from. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I mean, they draw up on this idea that, you know, I can export this group against that group, mm -hmm. as opposed to looking at the common history of, you know, we have a long history, and David Gollum can tell us more about that, particularly as regards labor, of people working together and overcoming those barriers. But unfortunately, we don't have politicians, a lot of politicians who do that. Let's see if we have some cards out here. Who has a card that uh, they'd like to read or pass to me for Dr. Evans? Got, here's one right here, Dr. Evans. No one wants to be first. You want to say it or you want me to read it? Okay. All right. What is it going to take for our nation to come together and love one another, again, without prejudice or malice? Pure love. One of my panelists, who wants to tackle that? Idris goes. It was something I believe that the keynote speaker said is that change, um, change starts with you and just the way that you react and you respond, you may not know how you're actually impacting everybody around you. So if, the, if people around you see the love in you and see how you respond to something, you actually, it's contagious. You can't change everybody, but if you touch and if you reach out to two or three people, it is contagious in that person. And if those two do the same thing, I saw um, a video that was on, uh, that actually was on Facebook, and it was a African American gentleman in Texas, and it was a Caucasian gentleman. They were both in cars, and I guess the Caucasian gentleman got really upset. He was an older man, and he got really upset because this black man he thought had cut him off, and really he didn't know he had. So he followed him, and he rolled his window down. And he said, "Hey, man," he said, "You're following me." He said, what are you doing? And he was really angry, but he kept talking. The African-American man kept talking to him. He said, if this was, he said, if I had a gun in here, he said, you just don't do this. He said, what are you so upset that you had to follow me? I had to stop and talk. And all this is being filmed. And the guy ended up apologizing. He said, you're right. He diffused the entire situation. We knew it was a risk, but he diffused it just because he didn't allow that situation to take him somewhere else. And he also, I bet, I put money on it, he changed that man's perspective of what he had uh, with an Afri another African American man or what he thought at that moment. So I think change starts with us and what we do and who we touch because that's all who we were around and then we can encourage those around us to act and react differently as well. Great answer, great question, great answer. Um, we have Can I say something? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner. So Ward. I'm, you know, I'm not going to uh, sit here and act like you know every day everything is all a bed of roses and there's no <laughs> thorns. Um, what I try to subscribe to, and what I try to teach my daughter, is that um, you give people basic human respect, and that basic human respect comes from the simple fact that they are living and they are breathing. 
-hmm. I have to remind myself of that sometimes with some people that I'm around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I come in and I speak because you're here. That's right. You're living. That's you're right. breathing. That's basic. That's right. I may not engage you in further conversation. I may not say goodbye when I leave because I am of my free choice and will at that point. I may think that we don't jive well together. I may feel you have negative energy and I'm not trying to take that home with me. Um, but as such, to, to answer that question of what do we do, if we can just get to the nitty gritty of it. I walk in to rooms, there are numerous people that I dislike. It used to be when I was in college and high school, people knew it. They said, I, I see it on your face when you walk in. You're like, ugh. But I've changed over time, so that's the reform and the progression of people, right? You have to see it in yourself first. And then I said, okay, I've got to change that a bit. That doesn't change the fact that I dislike 90% of the people in the room. But what I do when I walk in is I still say, hey, how you doing? How's everybody doing? It may be something I acquired from going to a southern school. Because again, as a New Yorker, we're just... Okay, but once I got down south and I recognized like people are walking in rooms and speaking and I'm supposed to say something there. Yes. Hey, <laughs> what did I do? You know, but as such, that's, that's where I say you pick up little pieces of what makes you better as you move along. For me, sometimes I have to pick up little pieces like all through the minutes of the day and give myself reminders all through the minutes of the day. If you picked up my Blackberry, you will see things that scroll across my screen all day. Life is the sum of all choices. If I choose to act an ass at that moment, I don't know how that is going to come back and affect me later. All the time, the reminders, it makes you better. We got another question back here. Don't comment. Go ahead, Cameron. Yeah. It's all right, it's not pushed to talk. So actually, Professor Jones, this is the answer on your question why people still hang to the South and they, they love the idea of the Confederacy and the flag. It's because we allowed them to keep their symbols of hope that they would rise again after the Civil War. So imagine what we had, if we hadn't banned the Nazi symbol in Germany. You're basically enabling and empowering these people in the South to keep the, their hope that the South rise again. You didn't finish crushing their hope. You let them keep their dreams that eventually that they'll go back to doing what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it sounds immoral and wrong about crushing one's hopes and dreams, but you didn't stop the problem. And this was our fault as Americans years and years ago. We just let the problem go hide away in a hole till it was safe to come out like it is now. We didn't solve anything. We, get, we got people their rights just a little bit, just barely. 600,000 people died just to, for these you know, rights and everything, just for it to rear its ugly head up again because we didn't finish the job that we set out to do that we should have done. You should have banned these symbols, banned the flag, do you, like put the, labeled these individuals as war criminals and, and anything else that I can think of. We didn't do the job good enough. In, in 1930, I think it's... Oh, yeah, you know, let me just, I can't remember my dates right now, but when Hitler rose to power, there was eight police officers killed at the beer push, at the beer hall. And they, these, these men were labeled as criminals because they were trying to defeat the Nazi party. After World War II in 1946 or something like that, they were re, they were re dug up and intermed at, at a national honor because these men did the honorable thing. Now, they were labeled as war criminals uh, against the, like, by the Nazi party during the time. And, this is what we should have done to the Confederacy after we were done. We should have labeled everything that they did as a crime, but we didn't. This is a problem that we created and we neglected after all of these years, and now it has come back to bite us now. And this is why we're dealing with it. It's just that's why the people still cling to their little, because we left their symbols of hope. That's why they love the Confederate flag. It's, it's almost an underdog story, except it's 100 plus years in the making. Yeah. Yeah. So. I digress. Interesting perspective. Uh, Vince, thank you. Thank you. Vince, can yes. I add something? Um, I, I might be called David. a Pollyanna yeah. or naive, but frankly, I think there is something concrete that we should all be doing uh, to answer the previous question, which is we need to be funding education. 
there's so much misinformation out there that we need, to be, we need to be paying our taxes, we need to be advocating for everybody to pay their fair share of taxes, we need to rebuild the public school system, we need to rebuild the public university system and make sure that it's all funded. Yes. Because we shouldn't be hearing the White House Chief of Staff talk about how we could have avoided the Civil War if only we had compromised more. <laughs> oh, yes. We shouldn't be hearing the President of the United States talk about how Frederick Douglass doesn't get a lot of press. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. We'll get through the evening. We have Can I slide question? a little <laughs> comment in just on how to love each other better? I think it's uh, people need to listen, think, and be slow to react. And that's what's lacking in our days now is because of the social media and how quickly people are getting messages. They're reacting, and they're reacting with anger inside their hearts because they haven't thought of things. And I think that's what propels a lot of the hate in our modern society that we see today. Wise words, Renee, thank you. Mr. Jones, you had a question. Uh, my question is, first of all, thank you. This is a wonderful event. My question is, where do you see race in 20 to 25 years from now? And the uh, twist to that, not I'm not looking for the, uh, the uh, political answer, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who wants to tackle that one? I'll start. Commissioner Orr. <laughs> First <laughs> off, the red there will be a difference in that there are more, there is more race mixing and children of mixed race who will, as Many millennials, and, and I credit millennials, I've taught millennials. I know at one point I was standing in the middle of a hallway as the principal of millennial teachers and saying, I can't stand them. But I see, <laughs> I see the value and the difference in that they have challenged the, the few boxes that used to be on applications that said, check one. And I, at one point, said, why do I have all these boxes? Because as a CPS principal, I just need the facts, ma'am. But to those children, and really to myself, because I'm of mixed race as well, but for me, I was like, well, they said three-fifths. That's what it was. Uh -huh. There it is. But they said, I challenge that. I want the additional back boxes. I don't just want biracial. Now there's multi-ethnic. Now there's check all that apply. <laughs> 20 to 25 years from now, guess what? There's going to be a whole lot more people checking, a whole lot more boxes than just black, white, and whatever we're deciding to do with the Hispanic culture that we can't figure out exactly what to put for that box. That's where I think it will be in 20 to 25 years. I think the conversation will be so different. I agree. Because I think people will be challenging people to choose one or the other. You got to be this or you got to be that. I don't think we won't still have discourse, but I think the discourse and the topic of the discourse will have changed. Outstanding, outstanding. Dr. Merrick. I, 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 oh. There's been a lot of discussion about talking to people and engaging with people, especially this should obviously extend to those at the ideological opponents, but how do you deal with people who use the chance to debate as a platform to spread ideas in bad faith, to basically bounce rhetoric off of their debate opponent, to speak to a wider audience, to prey upon fears? How do you deal with someone who, no matter what you say, no matter what evidence you present, will only use it as a way to spread their rhetoric of hate. How do you deal with bad faith debaters? Dr. Erickson, could you address that with a fundamental knowledge of people? Uh, D minus. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a really, really difficult question. I, I probably come at this, you know, I'm just one of these people who believes that uh, you know, I, I don't mean to, I'm not going to disagree. I, I certainly would defer to a lawyer. I just believe free speech is, a, you know, one of the greatest things that separates the United States from other countries. And uh, as disgusting and virulent and racist as some 
speech is. I'm one of these people who believe that people have a right to spew it, uh, and people who feel differently have just as much a right to combat it. Uh, I guess I would hold on to Renee's thing there uh, in a civil manner. Uh, and part of that, I guess, gets at what David said by being educated and being armed with enough information that you can rationally uh, defeat really stupid, racist ideas. Uh, and that's easier said than done. That's, that's the best I can do. And, and my apologies, I called you Dr. Erickson. I meant Dr. Eric. That's, Eric, a, that's so. okay. Done. Uh, just wanted to go back to the second part of your question in terms of where, where I think we'll be in a few years. Uh, I think our capacity to move is certainly undermined by the levels of violence in our society. This is, again, I don't mean to, I have no musical abilities, but this is a very violent civilization. It's a very violent society. I mean, we incarcerate more people in any country in the world, and we pay for it, and we seem to do it gladly. I mean, I was reading an article the other day um, about how, how much uh, how we are seeing a global perspective. Clearly, people of color are adversely or disproportionately represented in the, in the uh, incarcerated population. But the scholar pointed out, even if you take out people of color, if this was an all-white society, we still would be among the highest, we'd have the highest levels of incarceration in the world. And so in many respects, going back to the question back there, I mean, I think that we still underwrite violence tremendously in this society. Uh, 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 Vince and I talk about a, one of our uh, heroes, uh, Brian Stevenson. Yes. Brian Stevenson is, is he's head of the uh, in Equal Justice Initiative, Initiative. In, in Alabama, and he, much of his work involves defending people who've been uh, convicted to, uh, who've gotten death sentences, and it's fascinating work, and he's starting a new project. Uh, he start, he's uh, starting a museum uh, about lynching, lynching. Mm -hmm. and part of the objective is to, so that we don't forget, but I think that there's so much in our society, we forget how violent we are. But one other thing, just want to add to that. Um, if you've watched Michael Moore's film, Where to Invade Next, there's a really fascinating segment in there on Germany. Uh, in Germany, they have uh, essentially done what you said, outlawed Nazi symbols. We didn't do that here. Uh, so you go down the streets, and what they'll have, for example, is a suitcase of a Jewish person who was sent to the uh, gas chamber. Here we try to hide those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the ironies of Germany, and uh, this is Germany mm -hmm. now, uh, Germany is the site of the Rosa Parks house. Rosa Parks house in Detroit, the city of Detroit was going to tear it down because you know uh, whoever bought it, it has, wasn't able to pay taxes on it. Uh, an American artist who lives in Germany had the house dismantled and had transferred, <laughs> transported to Germany. So <laughs> it says something about our society when our, some, one of our major symbols of freedom, mm -hmm. her house is now in Germany. Yes. I know a lot of people want to ask yes. questions, sorry, but, but the, the issue of where we're going to be in 25 years, I just I can't let that go. Um, I oscillate between pessimism and optimism, but I have to say, as a historian, where were we 25 years ago? 25 years ago, we were acquitting the Rodney King police officers. Where are we now? We're acquitting police officers in Freddie Gray, Gray, Freddie Gray case, in Philando Castile case. Um, uh, somewhere along the way, some intellectuals were talking about how the police are the last bastion of racism and that before long, they will come around. Doesn't seem to have happened. I, I hope that we're better off in 25 years, but I said the same thing as a younger person 25 years ago. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Dr. West. Hi, thank you, Hi. everybody on the panel. Hi, Dean. Hi, President Maiman. Okay, questions, concerns. I've been listening to a podcast called Seen on Radio, NPR, out of Duke University that looks at anti-racism. Anti and a part of clearly, I highly recommend it, and it should be a part of our teaching tool here, what concerns me the most is looking at the systemic pervasiveness of racism over and over and over, and knowing that the First Amendment, people looking like us were not considered, we weren't even considered human. The 13th Amendment is the justification for mass incarceration, and it continues over and over. 
if we go back, if we look at race period, we know it's socially constructed. We know it doesn't even exist. It's not even real. We just all bought into it and believed in it and we keep it going just so for a certain population of white people can remain rich in our system. And so the, the division that's between us, we know is by design to keep something in place. My question for you is knowing that the most segregated day in our society in America is on Sunday. What do we do? And what do we tell our students who are even at 22 years old are told if they're Hispanic and have Polish friends that they can't come home with them because the color is different? How do we really dismantle this vicious chronic cancer that's in our society knowing that it's really about economics? Commissioner, you want to tackle that one? <laughs> Not quite particularly, no. <laughs> um, the systemic racism that exists in our country is perpetuated, I'm sorry, I'm trying to, sorry, is perpetuated in my, in my eyes just from the, the platforms that I'm in both at the state level and the county level. It's perpetuated, like you said, economically. Um, and I think because of the, the economic stressors that are placed upon us and that, like you said, we buy into them, right? We've bought into, um, you know, the, the credit, the et cetera, all of these things that hold us back from getting to a place where we feel like we're equal to people in some way, shape, or form. Um, I don't have the best answer for that, and I do, really do want to listen to that podcast. I missed the beginning part of where you said it was. I heard you say Duke University. Seen on radio, okay. Um, because I too want to be able to have a clearer answer for where the systemic, again, I go back to we can't legislate our way out of it, but as you said, we can in some ways. Oh. Yes. I agree, but we're also depending on humans who have the same types of <laughs> the, the same types of things that us common folk are dealing with to sit in these chambers and to make these decisions to legislate our way out of it. And so, you know, and that's no disrespect, of course, to our representative, who's also one of my mentors, but I look at the people who sit in the chamber and I say, well, well, where do you come from? And what's your, what's your ideal? What's your thought? I get my hand slapped a little because I ask, if given the opportunity. But again, I'm supposed to stay in my place and remain on my, my side of the fence of where I'm supposed to be and not ask these questions so that we can legislate our way out of it. So I feel like when we step in the voting booth with a lack of information, like lots of people do. And then we elect folks to legislate our way out of the problem that quite possibly come from ancestors who legislated our way in. Hmm, how does that work? And again, that's why I say I can't answer that question because these are the things that where my mind circles when I'm up late at night or trying to drive home peacefully, um, because I say, well, how do I depend on this body of people to get me to this place that I'm supposed to be agreeable with? I think we also have to um, not be t solely dependent upon educators to educate us. I think we have to, there's some accountability and if you take a look at the civil rights movement, that those that march, those that advocated for the rights of the minority, and they didn't depend upon educators to educate them on what was right and what was wrong. They took it upon themselves to first 
um, be accountable for their own actions and to read and to educate themselves on the history. And I think that's the problem is that we don't, um, technology and the internet has made it easy for, I wanna say, uh, this, this particular generation to infuse themselves with knowledge. And they believe that it's knowledge, you know. I saw it on Facebook. Uh, it was tweeted. <laughs> so it's law, <laughs> you know, that's what happened. Um, but it isn't. So you need to take the extra step to go and do the research. And it's the education. The reason why you're passionate about even your question is because you have sought out other channels and other ways to educate yourself on different things. And that's what makes it different because once we educate ourselves and once we take that, once we become accountable for our knowledge and not just be dependent upon sitting in a classroom for 50 minutes, be it an hour, or whatever, and you couple that with also having a free exchange with your fellow classmate who may not be from your same race, that is how we start making the change because we have to listen. I have to applaud everybody that's here because the fact that you even took out two hours to come in this room, that's change right there. Mm -hmm. Indeed. <laughs> and I understand that it may have been, I could get an extra point, I understand that, but guess what? You made a choice as to whether or not you wanted this point or did you want to get some additional points in a different way. It still was a choice. You had a choice to either come through that door or not. And once you came through this door, you have a choice to stay or to leave. Right. The fact that everybody has come into this room primarily has remained, has remained alert, has remained engaged. We may dismiss it when we, but the way you came in this room is not gonna be the way you walk out of this room. Absolutely, very good, very good. Okay, Renee, you had a comment. Adding into the young lady's question here. Uh, pardon me? Oh, sorry. Okay. Ooh, oh. um, I think another aspect that we have to say, uh, think about is, uh, is the family. What, do you, what are you teaching? What are you giving your children? You have to think, first of all, where did I come from? Okay, now you're an adult. You might have come from a very, I grew up in a lily white neighborhood, okay? There was, I think, two black families in the area I grew up in. I can tell you the amount of bad stuff I heard coming out of mouths of people that were my so-called friends that I vehemently disagreed with. Um, it's your choice then when you educate yourself, okay, and you're educated and you learn things in, in primary, high school, and then university level. What do you do with that? Do you just keep going along with, with the stuff that your own family has pushed into your brain? Or do you make a choice to say, that might be your opinion, but what do I, where do I take it? And then what do I do with my children? So, yes, we have a big chance to change. That's where did I come from? What do I place into my children and what do they do in their future? That's the only way. The one thing that never is gonna change is that there's bigotry and racism in this whole world. It's in every country. If you look at Germany now, they just voted in a very extreme right party into the parliament. That's bad, it, it, it's scary, it's not nice. They did that in Austria. We are global, we're small, we're like one family. It's not just about us, it's about everybody. You know, and I always question what question goes through my mind. Why, when we're Americans, do we have to have a box that says, I'm a black or a Caucasian or a whatever? You know, I've got creamy peach skin and you have brown skin and you have blacker skin and, you know, we're all different shades. But that, that's just normal, that's how we were created. You know, that's why do we, uh, as the only country, say we're different things, we're different colors. If you're a German and, and you came from Turkey and you have a German passport, you don't say I'm a Turkish German. You're German, that's your passport. I'm an American, you're an American, you're an American, we're all Americans. Thank you, Renee. Period. We had a, oh, there she is, okay. I'm here. 
<laughs> Hello, I'm Akaya Gasser. So I have like a two part question. So excuse me if it's like really long. So the first question is, we all talked about how we need to constantly educate each other. And um, I'm not a millennial. So when I was younger, we were still like barely using floppy disks. They were like coming mm -hmm. on the brink, <laughs> honest, right? <laughs> so Facebook, Twitter, none of that was really relevant during my time. And I came from a family that was this very, I came <laughs> from a family that was extremely poor. Um, and my family did not know the relevance of educating me about how learning about what's going on in the House of Representatives and knowing what's going on in the House of Senate was extremely important. I didn't learn that until I got to higher education and now I'm a non-traditional student, right? So fortunately my children now know the importance of that social change and really being more educated. But my question is, what? how do we expect to progress as a collective when we're not properly educating, even as educators and even as family members, when we're not even educating each other on our past histories. I mean, I didn't really learn about a lot of the important black aspects until I went to college and took sociology classes. Before then, I was a little bit ignorant. I mean, I knew about Martin Luther King. I knew about Malcolm X. I knew about the Black Panther Party. Yeah, but that was about it. The Civil War, any of those things, yeah, kind of really didn't know about that. I didn't even know how that I identified to me as my ethical background. Mm -hmm. So how do we expect to move forward as a collective when we still are not even accepting acknowledgement or not even trying to educate each other um, or educating the communities that we know that are still displaced? that do not have the resources to be educated, that don't have the knowledgeable resources in their communities to educate them, how do we expect to move forward? But then also, how do we expect to move forward as a collective when we allow people like our president to be leaders, but we don't educate people on the political process, but then say, hey, the reason why he's in office is because you elected him. But I didn't know how much my, elect my vote meant until I got I the cottage. Know. Now I know, now right? You know. Now I know, right? Now you know. Now I know. But I have nieces and cousins that are all in high school and college. And when I talk about the house bill, they're like, the what bill? What's that? Mm -hmm. You talking about the light bill? No, the house of representatives. <laughs> you know what I mean? The house bill. So my question is for all of you guys that are in that field currently, what do you suggest as another way that we can try to influence social change by education, especially at that lower community local level? Because that's extremely important. Well, okay. you touched on something that, um, I mean, is a great debate that I, I believe has fallen by the wayside because of just the political climate right now. But, you know, if you think back two, three years ago, we were fussing about Common Core and federal overreach and how the states are supposed to do their thing, right? Because everybody's got their part that they play in this. And, you know, I, having sat on ASCD Legislative Committee, which is a education-based committee that goes to D.C. and actually, um, I call it my heels on the hill, um, to, to talk to legislators and say, hey, I was in the trenches. I had my sleeves rolled up and I was told uh, by the construct of the school that I can't teach that. That's, that, that's not what you're supposed to have. That's, we, we laid this out for you, <laughs> sweetie. Mm -hmm. um, you're not supposed to go that way or that way. I got written up the first three years I was in the classroom. Um, <laughs> Uh, that doesn't mean that I fell in line, but it means that I <laughs> figured out a way around the matrix. And so again, I say that, you know, that spurs another conversation because we get, like you said, we have ADHD, right? Mm -hmm. These are all conversations that have started at some point and then we let it go, which then allows others to come in and say, well, then there'll be no more common core. There'll be no more of this, there'll be no more of that. Well, and my mother and I have philosophical differences. She's a teacher from back when. And um, my, she said, well, you know, we don't need Common Core. And I said, well, there's a reason for it. I get it. I get that my nephews in Tennessee 
were learning multiplication in fifth grade, <coughs> and we were teaching multiplication in third grade. Well, to me, that's systemic. It continues to keep below the Mason-Dixon line, the Bible Belt, where it is educationally. It continues to keep the Northeast, particularly Massachusetts, where it is in the upper echelon of education. And we've done the same thing with our universities. And so, and, and yes, it's funding, but it's content. And so we talk about where do we go, how do we get people to the same place educationally, we can't even agree on the basic things that we should teach all children at the same time. We had to legislate our way in Illinois back to teaching civics. Huh? <coughs> I don't even remember where civics went away. But somehow in between all this funding and all the, the hard decisions that I even had to make as a principal, we said, I can't afford to pay a civics teacher. <laughs> These teachers require more money because we put more <laughs> stock and value in math and science because we went that route, right? Mm -hmm. you know, steam, steam, I'm sorry, STEM. STEAM for me because arts had to get included, right? But as such, we started taking our money and we started shifting it towards pay these teachers the most money because they teach what we value now. Okay. Yeah, this is Back probably again, this is probably going to have to be the, the the last question, and this one um, is going to probably be um, need need some real good answers from you all up there at the the front table. <coughs> the panel speaker says change starts with you, and that change can become contagious. When it gets to the First Amendment rights, many voices, especially conservatives, are shut down. So how can that change actually start from the conservative voice, given that liberals outnumber conservatives? Ooh. All right, David. Where do liberals outnumber conservatives, uh, generally speaking? <laughs> it, may, it may be in this room. <laughs> and how, how, do, we, how do we define liberal and how do we define that, That's my question. Define liberal, define conservative. I'm a liberal conservative on some days, and I'm a <laughs> conserva liberal on others. It just depends on what I am valuing, which for me, I have morals, I have standards, and I have values. That is what I have taught to my child, and that is what I tried to instill on at least 3,800 children who I was entrusted with at some point. What are your morals? Way different. What, do you, what are your standards? Standards ebb and flow based on where you are, who you're with, who you're in, interchanging with, right? And then what do you value? I don't mean materialistic, even though half of the kids that I taught was like, I value my Xbox. <laughs> okay, I get that, but what do you value in the sense of if someone came to you and said, these are your freedoms, but I'm going to take, you, you pick your top three and then the rest are gonna be taken away, which was an exercise I used to do in my fifth grade class. These are all your freedoms. Pick your top three. We go back to that list of 50, nobody has the same thing. So I still feel like we're at a place like, what is your moral footprint? We talk about digital footprints, carbon footprints, you know, we got it all defined out, but what's your moral footprint? And that doesn't necessarily have to be defined or delineated by the household you come from, the culture you affiliate with. Again, I'm very comfortable some days being a conservative liberal. And I say it out loud. I don't agree with either one of you. I'm somewhere in the middle. And if you don't like that, that's fine. But you can't, you can't move me either way just because you think I'm supposed to choose one of these Sides, but again, some days I wake up and I'm a liberal conservative. Okay. That's where I am. With it. All right, here's what we're going to do now. I'm going to ask each of my panelists to answer the same question, mm. 30 seconds each, okay. and we're going to start with Deidre Stokes, our attorney on the panel. <laughs> so this. Here's the oh, question. Okay. 30 seconds. 
we are facing turbulent times, mm -hmm. what actions do you believe we should take to bridge these turbulent times? Um, Please go forward. I think today is a step forward. Today, events like this, events where the room is comprised of different, age, different people of different ages, um, different race, different backgrounds, sitting here, listening, engaging, and understanding. I think that that's where we start. And then from there, we grow, we don't stop. I think what happens, the young gentleman back there said, is that um, one, when we have these events, we have to take something away from these events and build on it and have the next step. So I hope this is a first of many different forms or first of many to give those that are thirsty and those that want to know what can I do, give them that ability and the great place to have it is in a place of education. So. Excellent, excellent. Commissioner Orr, same question. We've always been in turbulent times. <laughs> Just hasn't been as um, <coughs> out That's right. for everybody. <laughs> so, so how have we dealt with turbulent times before? That's, that's what I question. It's, this just didn't start. It just got progressively worse. Or it may be, it's, it's so in our face at this point. But I'm with you. It's the education. Education doesn't just exist in educational institutions. I educated a gentleman on the elevator the other day. Felt good. Mm -hmm. Not because I just felt like he needed a doom doom for the moment, but you asked me the question, you thought you were going to get a real, you know, trite answer, but in the process of that elevator speech, I knew he got educated as he walked away. And when I saw him the next day, he was like, I remember you. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> Education happens everywhere. Stop thinking that it's got to happen in some specific space. Do it civilly, though. Challenge in a way that not that you're trying to, you know, slit somebody at the throat or cut them off at the knees. Do it in a way that they walk away from it saying, hmm, you may not change them, but you at least put that shadow of it out. Right. Dr. Gollin. Start by reading a print newspaper, even if you read it online. Mm -hmm. Then tell everybody you know mm -hmm. to read a print newspaper, even if you read it online. Then avoid the articles during election time that are about a horse race, and focus on the articles that actually say what the candidates stand for. Think carefully and then actually vote. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, David. Don. I think two basic things. One is that uh, we are a society where people talk a lot. There's a lot of talk going on, but we have not enhanced our capacity to listen and to hear others. That's one. And the second one is that, you know, we have to get outside of ourselves I mean, you know, so often we're enamored with ourselves. There's all sorts of ways in which we get more deeply into ourselves, and on one level that's good. But we also have to travel outside of ourselves. Uh, observe others. I mean, see things from a different perspective. Uh, look at, try to look at some things. We can't exactly walk in another person's shoes, but at least just think about what it might be like to be in someone else's position, particularly those who are much less fortunate than we are. Dr. Eckert, what do you think? Uh, I want to follow up on something that Dave said, and that is I, I, my ex-wife was an editor, so I guess uh, I can't believe I brought her into the conversation. But anyway, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to second the idea of, of uh, sorry, uh, read a print newspaper, uh, reject the idea that there's such a thing called fake news, uh, reject the idea that uh, there are quote unquote alternative facts, and uh, uh, read, read and really continue reading and trying to educate yourself. And I, I just echo everything that was said from, from Deidre right on is, was just 
I, I agree totally. There's my 30 seconds. Thank you. Renee, okay. what's your perspective? I would say don't stand on polar sides. Don't be north and don't be south. Use your ears and listen. Use an empathetic ear. Use an um, active ear, listening actively to what somebody is saying. And use your reasoning and your critical thinking to make your opinion before you speak out because the words that you can say can really cause a lot of turbulence and add to what's out there. So we have to diffuse um, with, our, with our speech, speak more love instead of so much hate. Thank you, Renee. And Juan, what's your view? It's hard being the last person because uh, literally as it was going down, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to say. This is what I'm going to say. So I actually agree with, like everyone was saying, everyone agreed. The first thing I said was um, you actually have to educate yourself, but you also have to be able to listen to the opposite side. You just can't be trying to go off what the other person's saying because, if, of course, if you're getting mad, the person's just going to get madder and it's just going to keep on escalating. So you have to be the the as it says, the bigger person, you have to stay down because then the argument will never get higher. Thank you, Juan. And I asked President Maimon to answer the, last, the same question. Thank you. Um, this has been a wonderful panel. I want to thank everybody and I thank all of you for being here. Uh, I would say that it is very important to evaluate information. That's what our education here at Governor State, no matter what your uh, field, is all about that uh, in you know fa information is at the click of a computer key, but you have to be able to assess it. Mm -hmm. I I think that I want to echo what people on the panel said that do not allow tyrants to tell you that everything is fake news. <laughs> you can make judgments about what uh, is factual and uh, evaluate that and, and apply it. Uh, it's very important to be uh, civically engaged, as we say, uh, at Governor's State. And that doesn't mean just in the presidential elections. It means in the school board elections, the local elections, the primary elections that are coming up in March, mm -hmm. uh, that paying attention to those extremely important and to make judgments. Also, I would suggest the truth is almost never at the midpoint between two positions. And that's why it's so difficult in terms of analyzing complexities. And we have to also avoid false equivalencies. Well on one hand, on the other hand. They're almost never equivalent. And I think also we need to support, and, and I do want to give uh, thanks to our representative, Will Davis, because he fought very hard uh, in the last session in the General Assembly for two, ver yes, for two very important things. <laughs> one was July 4th, July 6th, we finally got appropriations to higher education. Uh, we were, uh, you know, we were moving along and doing our best, uh, but we needed those appropriations, we needed that stability, and he fought for that. The other thing that you may not know about is that he worked across party lines on new ways of funding K through 12. Mm -hmm. And that is extremely important because it isn't all about funding, but let me tell you, if there isn't investment and resources in education, uh, we, we are really uh, hamstrung. And so I want to, uh, let's thank Representative Davis for both of those things. <laughs> and finally, in your family settings, at the Thanksgiving table, uh, at uh, your, your talking with neighbors, as many of you said, all of those are opportunities to listen but there are also opportunities in an elevator uh, to, to educate. And you know, let, let's make sure that we spread the word 
And one of the most important things is to encourage everybody to vote because uh, otherwise we're going to be dealing with situations that are very difficult for us to deal with. And finally, continue to come to forums like this and attend class. Thank you. <laughs> can, I, can I give you all a resource? Um, because there are, you know, elections are coming up real soon. Um, there is something that I utilize and I send out all across the United States to people called Ballotpedia. And if you put in your um, area code, right, zip code, sorry, you put in your zip code, it'll show you everybody who's on the ballot that you can vote for. And as such, you can start researching those people. And it gives you an opportunity to feel like a much more informed voter. Um, Many people don't vote like they vote all down the ballot for judges. And some of these are the very same judges who are incarcerating and et cetera and, and, and do not want to do bail reform and all of that. I mean, you need, to, you need that information. It's not just the top of the ticket. Mm -hmm. It's all the way down. And at least there, you get some very neutral baseline. Here's everyone I can vote for. And then you get your free will. Go find out the information you need instead of people look at the top of the ticket and then they just kind of from there. Oh, I saw a sign on the street that said so-and-so's name and they picked that. No, honestly, that's what people say, you know. So please utilize that. Ballotpedia information is there. You put in your zip code. It'll tell you who, who's got who. Okay, before I turn the program back over to Dr. Bruce uh, f to, to conclude it, I want to make a couple advertisements. Uh, for those of you who are, are faculty and students and staff, on the 12th of this month, we're having our, um, our day-long uh, symposia. The 10th, I'm sorry, Friday the 10th. We're having our day-long uh, symposia uh, on the stage, and uh, we promise that it'll be more this kind of discussion as, as we... Uh, as we still look at these critical issues related to our community, our university, and our society. And the other thing is, um, on the president's page of the uh, website, I mean of the, yeah, of our portal to the website, on the main page, if you go to the president, uh, office of the president, you're going to see that the campus inclusion team has a web page. So please take a look at that. And if you think of some things that need to be there, please let me or Maristella know and, and we'll make sure that happens. And, and then the, the, the last thing I'd like to say is I want to thank um, each and every one of you for, for the time and commitment it takes to, to come out and be a part of a program like this. And, and I, I am sure that uh, um, you all will agree with me that, that it was worthwhile to hear these voices. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I just want to thank all of you. I want to thank President Maimon for coming to the event tonight, for staying with us for the two hours, Dean Merrick, and I also want to thank the people that worked so hard with me, and we worked together as a team, and that's uh, Professor Vince Jones. Would you stand? <laughs> Professor Rupert Evans. And the panel, again, thank you so much. People came from far up north, from Winnica and Glencoe and all of those areas to be with us today. Um, and just want to thank you. And I, as I close, I want to say I wrote my dissertation on the framing uh, of journalists on school vouchers. And as we think about what we're going to leave here with tonight, journalists may tell us what to think and how they frame the stories but you get to control what you think about. And we are hoping that when you begin to think about these issues and think about Charlottesville, that what you think about is being the change that you want to see in the world. Thank you.